Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Yesterday, just before 11am Pacific Time, the FAA dropped their long-awaited, long-anticipated, long-delayed uh, environmental impact report thingy for Starbase down in Boca Chica, Texas, where we had been previously seeing lots of starships flying and crashing. We had been rather more uh, subdued in the last few months as the report was running, and they were, of course, getting ready for an orbital launch. And, you know, this is a monster of a report. And the main thing behind here is that they already had a proper environmental review to use this as a launch site for a smaller rocket for Falcon Heavy. But for the much larger booster, there was some concern that they might have to do another another environmental review, right? Which, of course, takes a very long time. So this report was basically to say, can we take what was agreed upon for Falcon Heavy and apply it to a rocket that is many times larger? And yeah, it's a 200, 200 pages or something, lots of legal stuff, lots of uh, minutia, but most importantly is the phrase, finding of no significant impact, or FONSI. Hey. So yeah, this is the important part. Basically, what what's happened is while they've been writing this, they said various interested parties have said, well, we think this could impact our operations or requirements or you know legal precedents. Um, can we mitigate it somehow? And so to mitigate these, there are 75 items that have been identified that SpaceX needs to comply with. And these aren't things that have been dreamed up out of like some bureaucrat's head. No, these are things where uh, the interested agency or the affected party and SpaceX have got into a dialogue and said, OK, we'll agree that this isn't going to impact us if SpaceX does this. And there's some very simple ones. There's like, oh, well, find an ocelot they're getting a $5,000 a year donation. There's a fishing tackle rental you know, charity. They're also getting a donation. Uh, SpaceX is going to be putting in signs and wildlife viewing areas. So these are things where it was agreed upon. And yes, they are apparently going to be writing a report on the historical significance of the Civil War and Mexican War site. And frankly, I'm not sure why SpaceX is, has decided that they would want to write a book report but they had to agree to it. I mean, they could have just given some money. I mean, maybe there's somebody at SpaceX was like, you know, we could pay these guys something, but I would really love to spend some time writing a book report about the Civil War. You know, Civil War is kind of important down there, I guess. You know, I mean, Texas, its borders are very relevant. Anyway, um, yeah, so this basically sets SpaceX for going forwards and continuing to develop at their facility. Uh, it, it will allow orbital launches there. However, it is definitely not the huge number of launches that were once anticipated. It appears that during this review process, there are, things have been scaled back a little, partly because uh, you know to accommodate the the you know needs of other parties, but also because I think SpaceX has realised that they're really wanting to be launching out from Florida, hence the expansion and development of the Roberts Road facility. So. Now it looks like they're going to be limited to initially, but you know this is a, a number which is in the report. It's like five orbital launches and five suborbital launches. However, it sounds like SpaceX aren't interested in suborbital launches anymore. That may change, I imagine, if you know they have problems. I mean, I could imagine that they might want to change, uh, might want to do more suborbital flights if they have some specific problems with the thermal protection system and they really want to get cameras on it. And so the scaling back of the number of launches also meant that they were able to cross off some other things from their list of requirements, which were potentially increasing the impact. There would be like a refinery, which was going to basically take standard natural gas and you know, distill it or whatever, refine it down to methane, because when you're using super cooled, subcooled, densified propellant, Anything that isn't methane is just going to become chunks of ice, and that's not great when you're putting those through pumps on an engine. Another thing that will be lost is the desalination plant, which would be needed to produce large amounts of fresh water for things like deluge systems on the pad to protect them. Uh, with a smaller number of launches, it sounds like they're, they're going to be quite happy to just use seawater or truck in water. So uh, with the smaller number of launches, it just makes as much sense for them to truck in this stuff 
for now. There's not, not going to be any pipes coming in. This is going to be trucks driving along that road. Um, they don't need the giant power plant to support either of these, so that's off the list as well. They'll get enough power coming in from the power lines and from the solar farms that are on site. Uh, another significant change, which is actually technically an improvement for SpaceX, is the number of days that they can close, right? So previously, I think they were only allowed like 180 hours of closures under the previous agreement for launch operations. And they've gone way over that. Now they're some, allowed something like 500 hours, but they're not allowed to close the beaches on weekends during the summer between Memorial Day and Labor Day, which means, yes, the beaches will be open on July 4th if there are any sharks out there. I know you're always excited to hear that. Um, there are certain holidays which they are not allowed to close the beaches. Uh, during the winter, they can close it during the weekend, but again, certain holidays. So yeah, people get to come in and out. Now, there is like another 300 hours of time budgeted for dealing with anomalies. And that means if they had to clean debris off the beach and keep that closed while they did that. So hopefully they don't need to dig into that, but yeah. Now, speaking of anomalies, you might be wondering, does this mean that SpaceX can launch a booster tomorrow and watch it explode? Well, probably not, because they still have to get a launch license for this. And the launch license is like a separate document, and it's specific to a specific launch plan. So, you know, they'll put this together, they'll have a bunch of parties again, review it, and they have to specify what's going to launch, how big it is, what its trajectory is going to be, how it's going to come back, what they think the potential impacts are. And, you know, only then can they get that approved for flight. Now, what they can do is begin to try uh, actually test the full Starship booster stack, you know, actually do static fires. With that amount of thrust, it was way more than what Falcon uh, Heavy would be developing. So they, they needed to you know, get the sort of okay for this. Um, having said that, I think there's a number of mitigations they have to make sure are in place prior to that. Like some, some of the 75 things, some people are like, oh my God, SpaceX have to do 75 things. Half of the things they are already doing, it's like you have to build walls that stop debris flying around. It's like, yep building that already. You have to tie down your tanks during cryo tests so they don't go flying around. Who would have thought that? I, who would have thought that could happen, huh? Uh, yeah, there are a lot of small changes needed to you know, mitigate wild, wildlife effects. A lot of stuff about sea turtles changing illumination so that the sea turtles don't think that some lights at Starbase are in fact the moon because they want to be going in the right direction. There's uh, times where they can't close the beaches or they they can't uh, operate because there there could be a egg you know hatching season. Um, there's going to be like a, a a wildlife crossing placed on the highway because one of the problems with this is it was previously not a particularly busy area and now with a lot of traffic coming through uh, that is actually affecting the wildlife. Uh, SpaceX is going to have to provide a shuttle for its workers to get from Brownsville to uh, the site. Great, because you know what? All those fanboys turning up are <laughs> taking up all the parking. You know, I think, I think that's not a problem, to be honest. I take a bus sometimes and it works very well for me. So yeah, look, this is good for SpaceX, right? I, I don't think that any of the requirements are particularly onerous. In fact, most of them are things that SpaceX are already doing. Uh, I, I think that, yeah, it, it's going to get us through the first launch. We don't know when that's going to be because they still aren't ready. I mean, despite claims of certain conspiracy minded people, no, the FAA was not intentionally holding up the launch so that SLS could launch first. The booster still isn't ready. The ground equipment isn't ready. But SpaceX are working very hard to make sure it is in that state. And I, I fully believe that uh, they will... You approach this with renewed vigor and energy, and we will see a launch. I can't guarantee it will be successful. I can guarantee you it will be very exciting. And so, look, there's not much more to say. Like, I'm not an environmental lawyer. I'm not, you know, going to say that this is going to, you know, destroy the world or make the world a better place. I, I'm just like this. I know a lot of people are interested in what's happening. What I am aware of is that 
One of the charities they're donating to is Adopt an Ocelot, and if you adopt an Ocelot at a certain level, you get a really cool little uh, Ocelot plushie, so I really hope that if SpaceX need a zero-G indicator for one of their flights, they will consider the Ocelot. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Thank you.